mind doesn't engage. At all. We haven't heard a word out of him in the 18 months we've been dealing with this case. Apart from with you, and, uh, and a handful of his other confidants, he's a mute. He's surly, difficult, disengaged, withdrawn. You know, it's, it's, it's worrying, and we're not sure if this environment is the best place for him. It seems to be causing him to, to further retreat into his shell. Yusuf is complicated. He's fiercely intelligent, fiercely. His math stats are off the charts. His written English is near fluent already. He's miles ahead in sciences. And have you seen his artwork? Ms. Robson, I, I don't dispute what you're saying. So what, he, he's quiet and withdrawn? What, is shyness a mental disorder now? Does not shouting out everything that pops into your head put you on the spectrum? Ms. Robson, please, you're being obtuse. You know, he, he's, he's far more than that. I know. I'm sorry, it's just, look, it's not fair. We know nothing about him, where he's been, what he's been through. He's only been at the school a year. That's hardly enough time to pass judgment on someone, is it? I mean, I know that he can be moody and difficult. I'm the one who actually has to teach him, for Christ's sake, Matt, but he turned up out of thin bloody hair without a shred of family or a friend in the world. Can't we cut him an inch of slack? I'm not the enemy. Please understand that. I'm on Yusuf's side. I'm on your side. I, I want him here, in a mainstream school with mainstream kids. But I, I have to look after the other pupils as well. And they are scared and confused by him. I see the way they avoid him. I see them tease him. He's getting bullied. Not that that seems to touch him, but, but what happened last week was totally unacceptable. suggest to you? What would trigger a reaction like that? Let me talk to him. Please. I, I'm in on Thursday for a, a classroom assessment and a sit down with him. There has to be a marked improvement. There has to be. Or I recommend special measures and a, a transfer to a specialist school. I have to, Emily. say to you, Yusuf. So I'll give you the options. Option one, carry on as you are. Refuse to engage in the school. 
Sit silently in class, keep to yourself. Shut the world out. They'll pull you out of the school, out of the care home, and they'll transfer you to a different type of school in a hospital where they'll watch over you closely and keep you confined. Locked up, you said. They'll have to. It's not their fault. They find you. Complicated. You frighten them. They think there might be something wrong with you. With your head. With your mind. They'll try to teach you a different way and they'll give you medicine. Drugs to make you better. Or option two. Leave it all behind. Whatever it is or was is no one's business but your own if you don't want it to be. So leave it back there in your past and move forwards, you say. Make friends, be part of the school, be part of the world. Do all your homework, not just the bits you enjoy. Show everyone how brilliant you are. Not just me and Lisa at the home. Be engaged, be vocal, be uncomplicated. Morning, gentlemen. Everyone must write an A4 page on this subject and be prepared to read it out in front of the class on Thursday. Thomas, what did I just say? Oh, sorry, miss. May I suggest not talking to Lily when I'm talking to the class, and you, Lily? Sorry, miss. Right, they'll all be handed in at the end of class, so no pretending you've written it and freestyling in front of everyone, because that just doesn't work very well, does it, Jerome Coleman? Certainly not, miss. <laughs> because the sun is defo not. 400 miles from Earth, is it, Jerome? <laughs> no, miss. And how many miles is the sun from Earth, Jerome? 149,600,000, Miss Robson. And how many times did you have to write that out? 149,600,000. <laughs> I bet it felt like that. Right, it can be about anything. Good things, bad things, funny things, sad things. But I want description and detail, and I want it to be evocative. What's evocative, Tutu? Um, it's like um, making somebody... Like, feel something? Mm -hmm. That's one for you. Might have been two if there hadn't been like so many like likes in the sentence. <laughs> <laughs> right, who remembers what we did in drama last week about catharsis? Oh, bless you, miss. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tease the animals, miss. Button it, Raj. Right, catharsis. Oh, come on, was I just talking to myself? It's when a, a book or a film or a play makes you laugh or shout or scream or cry. It's your emotional reaction to what's happening and the effect that it has on you. The Greeks and the Romans believed it was one of the most important things for keeping us healthy in our hearts and in our minds. To release your emotions, to share them, to let them out. Not store them or bottle them up till they drive you nuts or make you explode. Catharsis helps us to be ourselves again.
my lord, that was pathetic. One more time, a bit of feeling, please. Good morning, 4D. Good morning, Mrs. Crossan. Better. I don't want you to give a warm welcome to Mr. Squires, who's here to observe the class today. Is he doing his presentation, miss? <laughs> Thin ice, Mr. Shah. Sorry, miss. You will be. All right, it is that time. So who wants to go first? The day that changed my life was August 8, 2007. I used to live in Baghdad with mother and father, my brothers and my sister. We had a nice house with a courtyard and we used to play there with a tennis ball. We played handball and ball tag. It was the best time of my life. My father was a doctor and he didn't like Saddam and one day he never came home. We never saw him again. My mother looked after us with my uncle after that. When the bombing started, we were all so afraid. My sister, Nadia, she used to cry all through the night. She was only four. My mother held her and sung to her. Said, my brother, he was 13 and strong. He looked after us. We survived somehow. Then the food stopped coming into Baghdad from the villages. The villages were dead or dying. There were no more farmers to farm. We ate tinned food, then ration packs, then rotten food, then cats and dogs we hunted in the streets. Soon the fighting was in the streets outside our house. One day my mother went with my brother to the market and a car bomb went off. There was nothing of my brother say it to bury. My mother did not die. She was strong. She survived three days on a mattress in the hospital with no medicine or painkillers. She died with us around her, singing to Nadia. We went home. I looked after my brothers and my sister as well as I could. We begged for food and sweets from soldiers and stole from dead people's houses. Then the water from the tap stopped, and we drank water from the gutter and from puddles. My brother and my uncle became very sick. They had fever and diarrhea, and they died in the same hospital as my mother. Then it was just me and Nadia. One night, while we slept, a drone blew up the house next door. You know it is a drone, because the noise is different to an airplane bomb. The wall of our house was knocked down. I was on the other side of the house. I could not move a single rock to find her. They were so big. I never saw her. The date was August 8th, 2007. The day I had no family in the world. I left Baghdad on a farmer's truck and I crossed into Jordan under the barbed wire. I found other Iraqis. They paid a lorry to drive us through Europe. We hid in the floor for three weeks. Two men died. When the lorry drove off in England, a man put a mirror on a stick under the, under the car and found me. They gave me tea with milk and sugar. They sent me to a home and 
I learned some English. Then they sent me here. I know I am strange. And I know I am quiet. And I know I am complicated. It is quite hard for me to understand everything. And how I am here. And why I am here. And not playing ball in Baghdad with my brothers. But I will try to be better. Thank you.